I'd like to hand over to Mary, professional scrum trainer at scrum.org. And she's going to talk to us about, well, Mary, what are you going to talk to us about? I'm going to talk a little bit about product definition. And uh, your mission really resonated with me, getting out of our silos by defining products, actually. So that's what I'll be talking about today. So at this point, I'll go ahead and share my screen. And shall we go ahead and get started? All right. Okay. So here we go. Product definition. Uh, sharing my screen and from beginning. Here we go. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. Yes. So first off, I just want to say thank you so much for inviting me. I am a passionate believer in your community and all of the great things that you're doing to bring bring teachers, bring ideas forward and sharing them with the rest of the community. So I think that's fantastic. I'm here to talk about product definition and how that can really, I think, transform value delivery for organizations. My name is Mary Iqbal. Um, I have experience as Agile Transformation Manager for over 60 Agile teams. I am a Scrum.org professional Scrum trainer. I um, have founded my own business, Rebel Scrum, which is, yes, named after Star Wars, which is why I've got the Star Wars background behind me. And I'm also the organizer of Scrum Day. So I'm thrilled to, to partner with you, you all um, to be part of this series, this Christmas special, featuring some of the speakers from last year's Scrum Day. I do want to mention that Scrum Day 2024 is already scheduled, so save the date. It's available yeah. at scrumday.org. I do recommend. And I will say, Mary, Mary, with Rebel Scrum is also a gracious sponsor of Scrum Masters of the Universe. So we want to recognize that as too. Thank you, Mary, for being a sponsor as well with Rebel Scrum. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, okay, so let's let's get into it. Without further ado, for today's agenda, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is a product and why is this important? And then I'm going to share my secret sauce of how do we define products at an organization? Um, I'll tell you a little bit of a, a story about a, a successful product definition that I've been a part of in the past, and then I'm going to open it up to Q&A. Uh, so without further ado, let's rock on to it. So first, I want to take a look at the 16th annual State of Agile report from Digital AI. So this is the longest running um, report of its kind that's available in the industry today. I read it every year, actually, pins and needles when it comes out, actually. Uh, but this is an interesting question. So the question is, top reasons, um, let me move, the, move this box, top reasons why people are not satisfied with their company's Agile practices. So the number one reason was legacy systems, it's not con used consistently across teams. But what I found was interesting was the fourth reason was siloed teams cause delays on deliverables. And then if you look at the, you know, the second to last on the screen, dependencies, both of those things, and you could make arguments about more of them, but certainly both of these things are related to defining products, as we're going to prove in just a moment here. Um, so I think this is really interesting. This is a problem in the marketplace today. So what do I mean by defining products? What's happened is a lot of companies go agile, which is great, right? Um, the growth of agile has been astonishing the last few years. But what happens is a lot of companies go agile within their current teams. So let's say that you have a Boomi team or a Java team or whatever technology, SQL. Teams or a lot of many organizations go agile. And they go agile within their current team structure. So I might be on the agile team for the Java team or the Boomi team or the SQL team. And that's great. You know, you can get a lot of value from that. But what's even better is if you take a step back and say, okay, these, these, these technologies are fantastic, but what are we actually trying to deliver? What's our product? And that's when you're going to really get the real magic of agile. Agile is all about cross-functional teams working together without tasks, but, but with goals, right? Remember the Harvard Business Review, the new, new product development game. One of the best quotes from that entire article, in my opinion, is something along the lines of, you bring together cross-functional teams and give them goals, not tasks. 
And so when you bring together a cross-functional team, the power of that is what is the real power behind agile frameworks. So in order to, to really do this, you need to take a step back and ask the question, what's our product? Who's our customer? And rather than going agile within your current silos and your current technology teams, take a step back and ask, who's our customer? What are we trying to deliver? And bring together the team that's necessary to deliver that. And that is the magic of Scrum. Uh, the real, that's where you're gonna start to get the real magic of Scrum. When you think about Scrum, and even in the Scrum guide, it says Scrum is delivering complex products. Products, right? Not complex technology solutions, right? It's complex products. We use Scrum to deliver complex products. So knowing what that product is, is really important. On the right-hand side, I have this quote from a Gartner article. The most successful agile transformations involve adoption of the product model in which application delivery resources are organized into standing teams aligned to enduring products. So what do we mean by products again, right? Products cross technology silos. Let's say I have a website, right? I might need people who are doing the user interface. I, mean, I might need content writers. I might need, need testers and SQL people and backend developers, all of those people working together. Because when they're not working together, they're handing work off from team to team to team. And that just slows value delivery. It makes things unnecessarily complex, right? But when we bring them together, we have one product goal, not many product goals, but one product goal. And we're all working towards that one product goal. We're not handing work from team to team. So that sounds great, Mary, but how do we know who should be on our team? How do we know what our product is? Before you know who's gonna be on that team, you need to first define your product. And to define your product, you need to think, start with the customer. So let's zoom out for just a minute, right? How does this work? You need to understand who is the customer. In order to define our product, we ask the question, who is my customer? What are their pains? What are their gains? What is my solution to them? Only once you've understand that can you actually have a vision for where are we going with this product. And only once you understand that can you have a goal, right? What's our step towards the larger vision? And once you understand that, then you have a single product backlog for your product. But it all starts with understanding who is my product? And what is my product, right? And once you have that product, having that single product owner, who's the bridge? So if you think about, and this is um, from the professional scrum, a modified from the professional scrum product owner course. If you think about your product, right? A company can have many products. You might have a healthcare organization that has a claims processing system. Um, and then they might have other products. But within those, within the company, um, all of those products need to be aligned to the company vision. So that product owner is the bridge between company vision and the scrum team. But that product is the vehicle through which we're actually delivering that value. So taking a step back then, what is my product? I've been talking about products an awful lot. A product is anything that can be offered to the market that might satisfy a want or a need. That is straight out of a college level marketing textbook, right? Marketing seventh edition. It can be an internal product or it can be an external product. But the best way to start is asking, who is my customer? What are their pains? What are their gains? And from there, what are all the services that I provide to them? The pain relievers that I'm providing to them, the gain enhancers, what are all the features that I'm providing? And then from there, which features are grouped together in a single product, right? So I may provide um, lots of services, but which ones actually wrap up together in a bow and which ones are a product? Um, every product, there's always a product. It's just not always obvious, actually. You think it would be, but when you sit down to think about it in your own organization, it can take a minute, right? It's not, it's not always obvious, but you need to be careful when you define your products that you don't define them too narrowly. It's really important that you start with your customer that it's outside in. Every product has a customer and that customer can be the end consumer it can be the buyer. Those can be two separate entities, right? Or it can be both. But when you think about your product, you need to identify those individuals. Who's my consumer? Who's the buyer? Who's the using the product? 
And then from there, what are the services that I'm providing to those individuals? And then from there, grouping those services into a product. This is an art, right? Not a science. The way you think about this can very, very, very much depend on your industry. And you're going to have to apply your own, your own tactical knowledge, your own strategic knowledge to determine what makes sense. How do we, how do we, where do we draw the lines? When I'm thinking about products and I'm trying to decide, okay, which services go together? I'm looking from the outside in. And I'm also thinking which services have the most dependencies on each other, right? So if I'm thinking about a product and let's say it's a website, let's say a website's my product. How big do I draw that box? Am I gonna include the servers in that product or is it just the people who are delivering the website? But think about which teams have the most dependencies on each other. And those should be included in that product box. What happens if you define your product too narrowly? is you're gonna create a lot of dependencies where we're handing work from team to team to team to team and it's just slowing down value delivery. You're gonna create unnecessary silos. Um, there'll probably be a higher work amount of work in progress. If you're having a service teams tend to hire higher, higher amounts of work in progress. Um, over committing is gonna be a problem for your organization. You may have conflicting priorities, right? Product A, if you define it really narrowly, may have different priorities than product B and getting them to align can be difficult. Um, your roadmaps may not be aligned. So be thoughtful when you define those products. And again, really start with that customer. So how do we go about actually defining our products? Because this all sounds great. I hope it sounds great. The first question I always ask is, Thinking about this product before we even get into this, is, is Agile a great fit in this environment? So Agile is not a great fit everywhere. If you could write work instructions to deliver that thing, you don't need Agile. But if you need creativity on how you're gonna approach that problem, if you need um, to think about or have um, uh, problem solving to figure out how you're gonna solve that, that's where Agile is a great fit. Um, we don't use Agile, um, for example, to process claims, right? Because there's work instructions for that. But we do use Agile to build the software application that's used to process those claims. Because every time I make a change to that system, I'm applying my knowledge. I'm figuring out how to apply that change that is before me. So the first question is, is Agile a great fit? If it is, then you just define your products. And the way you define your products is again, start with the customer and ask, who's my customer and list that out. And that's actually can be a difficult question. There's many types of customers, different personas, but list out your customers, group them, figure out um, what are my groupings? What are my different types of customers? You might even go so far as to define personas for your customer. Once you've done that, take a look and say, okay, what are my, what are my, customers' problems? What are the gains they're, they're seeking from my product? And list those out. That can take quite a bit of thought. It can take half a day or it can be very simple. It just depends on your product. And then from there, what are my pain relievers? And then from there, grouping, what are the features that we're providing and grouping those together into products? Once you've defined your products, only then can you ask the question, okay, here's my product. It's a website. Who do I need? What kinds of resources do I need to deliver that product? If it's a website, maybe I need content writers, designers, right? right, SQL people, Java people, whatever it is, identify those resources. And then from there, working with the resource managers to identify, okay, we, we think we need Java people, we think we need uh, testers, we need content writers. What are the guardrails within which these teams are gonna be allowed to self-organize to deliver this product? Do we wanna have a max of 10 people per team? Do we wanna have a requirement that every team have experienced individuals? Do we wanna require that every team can pull any type of work? What are those guardrails? The rules within which they're gonna be allowed to self-organize. Then from there, some kind of scrum training would be ideal so that the team has this common baseline, a common understanding of what are, the, what are the ways that we're gonna to work together? 
And then you can host a self-organization session, which usually takes four hours, usually, roughly. Um, you can do four hours remotely, four hours in person. Um, the timing can be a little bit different, but hosting that self-organization session is such a powerful experience. I've done this remotely for 60 people. I've done it in person. And I got to tell you, I kind of think the remote option is actually a little bit easier to, um, to, to work with, in fact, um, because you've got a lot more diverse, different opinions there. Once you've self-organized, launching those teams. It's, it is just as easy as launching those teams. Give them the support they need, the scrum masters, the coaching, the ongoing, um, making sure that management is supporting the teams and, and um, playing their proper roles. But continue and launch those teams. And then once you've launched them, allow them to continue to innovate. Make sure you're, you're using the scrum events appropriately, that you're delivering incremental value that the teams are um, using the retrospective to identify any improvements that they need to make to the way that they work together. So that's that's the the step by step. At this point I'm going to pause and ask for questions before I go into a tale of product definition. So I want to ask are there any questions that you might want to that you might want to share? Well, so far Mary, we haven't got any questions yet. But well, then maybe they're going to have to come through. Ah, here we have one. Any opinions or thoughts on is Agile the right fit in organizations deeply dependent on ERPs and SAP? I keep being told that it's too complicated to be Agile Scrum. Is it too complicated to be Agile Scrum? Definitely not. I have I've worked with organizations who have used Scrum in SAP. In fact, um, I might have an organization speaking at Scrum Day about using, um, in 2024, about using um, Scrum with SAP. So no, it's absolutely not too complicated. Um, I would venture to say nothing's too complicated. They use it to create fighter jets, for goodness sakes, right? So no, it is definitely not too complicated. One thing I would, I would urge you in those environments, though, is stick with the basics, right? Don't think that you should modify Scrum because we're too complicated. That's where the basics are even more important. Make sure that you're defining your products for SAP, for goodness sakes. You don't want to have a million different silos, particularly when working with uh, with an environment like that. So great question. Great That's question. Great, yeah, it is a great question. Uh, have you got time for another one? Absolutely. Whose decision is it to be agile? I mean, <laughs> which role is this? <laughs> You know, I got to tell you, it depends on every organization. So some, it depends, right? As with so many, so many answers with Agile, it depends. So I've seen it sometimes when you're delivering a simple project um, and it is a temporary endeavor. Sometimes the project manager will, will decide that, hey, we're going to use Agile. Sometimes, on the other hand, it comes from the executive level that says, mm. we're going Agile and this is a top-down you know, transformation. We're going to form these permanent product teams. Sometimes it happens yeah. that way. Sometimes it's middle managers. Sometimes I've worked with a middle, manager, a middle manager department and I've said, hey, this is a great idea. Why don't we do this? Let's try it. And sometimes the middle manager's director level. So anybody can lead this charge. Actually, I challenge you to lead this charge. If you're asking that question and you're, you're looking left and right, maybe it's you. Okay, right? so I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that right now, okay? <laughs> do you have another time for, a, for another question? Absolutely. Can you have a successful organization where one product is safe, um, like using safe, and the other is using Scrum? You can. You can use different scaling techniques within the same organization. Yes, you can. Um, I'll give you an example, right? I'm not with safe, though, particularly, but um, I was an Agile Transformation Manager for WPS, and we did use the Nexus scaling frameworks for some of our products. And some of our products just use simple Scrum because they weren't big enough to need much of a scaling framework. So they had their own sort of really just plain Scrum. It's fine, whatever works for you. One thing I would caution you is make sure that within the product you're consistent. So any teams working mm. together to support a single product should have the same approach. Single product, don't our single product backlog, same scaling approach. But Absolutely. Absolutely. I've had this experience as well, where um, I was looking to do Nexus within within a pro for for a product within the safe scaling framework, and they were looking at were we going to use less 
were we going to use Nexus or were we going to actually just integrate totally as safe teams, agile teams separately within the safe framework. So there was options and uh, the team wanted to go for the Nexus um, within safe because they were very close to Scrum. Fantastic. I think that's wonderful. And yeah, you can absolutely do that. I'm going to little, little plug it for safe. I mean, not safe, for, for Nexus. Um, I'm a huge fan of keep it simple, right? Mm. In my opinion, Nexus is the very simplest Scrum scaling framework that there is. And that's what makes it the best. Not a lot of overhead there. Just enough, but not too much, right? That's what we're looking for. Absolutely. Um, we don't have any other questions. Would you like to move on? Let's move on. So I'm going to tell okay. you a little, a little story of product definition. So I was working with an organization that had um, a, a system, right, that was, uh, it was a claims processing system, actually, in this particular instance. And we had defined that system very narrowly. There was different parts of that, which was considered a product. So for example, claims off match was a product. Claims processing was a product. Um, yeah, the uh, different pieces of the whole were products. And that was great. We were getting some value out of it, but we had a problem where, um, you know, handing off work from team to team was slowing, slowing us down. So what was a priority for the ops team wasn't necessarily a priority for a different team. And so we had this alignment on what are we working on? Because each product owner had his or her, her own priorities that they were working towards. And it was slowing down value delivery. So we took a step back and we, we asked, what are our products, right? Taking a step back and we actually uh, for, had a, this big two-day on-site meeting with our executive team. And we took a step back and we asked, what are the products that we're providing? And we started again with the customer, it, pretty much exactly what I've just told you before. It was an on-site meeting. There was maybe 30 people there. And we asked the question, who are our customers? And we split the room into maybe five different groups, I think, about four or five different groups. And each group was tasked simply with defining who's your customer. And actually, you'd think that would be easy, but it wasn't. Each group came up with actually a slightly different customer list. Um, some groups defined the customers very narrowly. Some were a little bit high level. Some had simply forgot about different types of customers. But each group then went on to present, right? We took turns presenting what is the customer list you came up with? What's the customer list you came up with? And each group then modified their own list based on feedback from all the others, right? So it was a great sort of liberating structure moment where we're splitting out the room and each room is, uh, right? I love, I'm a huge fan of liberating structures. Um, this was sort of a just a, a breakout, but if you get a chance, check out liberatingstructures.com, by the way, side note. Anyways, so each group, right, was presenting who are our customers list? And we iterated on that a couple of times. And then we tasked each group, what are the pains each customer is experiencing? What are the gains they're seeking to achieve from this product? Um, and each group went, we actually went out with that for like an hour maybe. Each group came up with those pains and gains and then they presented to a larger group where each getting ideas from each other, kind of walking around and looking at each other's boards. And we came up with this idea, what are the pains um, what are our pain relievers? And then from there, the money question, what are the services, what are the features that we're providing to our customers? What are our pain relievers? What are our gain enhancers? And we brainstormed those and each team came up with a list. What are the things that we do for our customers? And then at the end of the day, we asked the team, okay, from there, how would you combine those into products? And each team came up with their list of products. And we actually put it all into a giant spreadsheet overnight, right? Remove duplicates. And we came back the next day and we said, here's the products that we all came up with. We put it on a big board, right? Literally on a mural board, um, projected it in front of these 30 people. And we said, how are we gonna combine these, right? This is what the team came up with. Let's, let's do an affinity diagram and pull these products together and let's work on defining what they are. That actually took a whole half day to have this conversation in various iterations. How do we see this product? What are the services that belong with this product? What are the services that belong with that product? Right, so having this conversation, being very strategic about it. It was a fantastic workshop. We worked with leaders then, once we had that, um, those products, right? 
Then we had actually, I think it was four or five products that were defined out of that. Fantastic, yay, good for us. It was communicated out to the entire division. Here's our products. And then from there, we began to prepare for the next phase, which was a self-organization session. So we first, we first communicated out what those products were, and then we started to work with the IT managers, the managers of the business folks, anyone who might be needed to deliver those products. And we worked with that middle management layer to define, okay, we've got these products. What are the rules within which they're gonna be allowed to self-organize? We prepared those guardrails. And some of the guardrails were things like obvious things, right? Every team has to have some experience. We want to have, every team has to have developers. Every team has to have testers. We've got to have business folks. These are the types of resources that we need for these products, for each product. Once we had those guardrails, this is actually the funnest part for me, this next part, was the self-organization session. We brought all those people together, right? Each resource manager said, you're going to have five of these people, four of these people. And we brought all those individuals together in one meeting. It was remote, right? And we said at that meeting, here's the five products that have been identified. And each product owner was allowed to present a little bit of information about their product, right? Five products. Each product owner gave a little presentation. Here's my product, right? Here's our vision for the product. Here's our goal for the product. Here's our, the top features that we want to deliver. This, this year, or here's kind of the high level things that we have on our product backlog. And each product kind of made their sales pitch, come support my product, right? And then <laughs> individuals were literally just allowed to say, okay, I wanna be on this product or that product. And they literally put their names into each, each product category, right? Exactly. And you know, you would have thought there was some fear, a lot of fear about this from the management level. What if nobody wants to support my product? right? What if we have an unpopular product? We didn't have that problem, but I do get that question a lot. So I have not actually run into that. I've not run into somebody say that, that we don't want to support that product. It's not the cool one. It does seem to be that, that um, I just haven't run into that, but I'd be interested to hear from you if you have run into that. In my opinion, if you have a product that no one wants to support, maybe you have other problems. Maybe it's not a great product that people don't believe in it. And if your team doesn't believe in it, I'm curious, right? So in any case, people were allowed to, to self-select into which product they wanted to be to supporting. And then from there, right, each product broke out into its own breakout room. And some of the products had a large number of people. So from there, they had to ask, okay, for this product, we've got 30 people in here, right? How many teams do we want to have? Is it going to be, you know, five teams? Wait, if we have 30 people, <laughs> this is embarrassing. Six teams of five, five teams of six. How many teams do we want? Um, within each product. And so they were allowed to iterate on that. Um, and then once they had come up with a solution, right, six teams of five, five teams of six, whatever. Um, once they had come up with that solution within their breakout rooms, then assigning their own names to which of the scrum teams within this product do I want to support? So it was a really powerful experience. Um, over, overall, uh, that self-organization session actually took about four hours. Every time I do a self-organization session, it is, it's usually about four hours. Um, sometimes there's multiple products that we're allowing people to self-organize into. Sometimes it's just one product and we're doing a self-organization session for that product. But either way, what's powerful about this is not that they come up with anything special, right? This is probably what managers would have come up with, something more or less like this. Um, we probably would have had 30 people on that team. We probably would have had six teams of five or whatever. It's not that it's any more brilliant than any manager could have come up with. But what's powerful about it is the morale coming out of that session. The fact that people feel empowered to support that product. And furthermore, let's say six months down the road, within product XYZ, we have a major change in priorities. The team feels empowered to say, look, things have changed. Let's make it five teams of six instead or let's do you know, whatever it is. Priorities of change, we need to focus on this, we need to shift. And they can do that in a retrospective. That's what's powerful about it. Now you don't wanna be changing teams all the time. We actually did put a guardrail around that, that once you self-organize, you have to stay in place for six months was, was our guardrail. Whatever you feel works for you, but be aware of that when you're constantly shifting teams, there is a temporary reduction in efficiency.
So you don't want them to be reorganizing every sprint. But put that as a guardrail, right? Those are the types of guardrails we need to see from management um, to make sure that the team members have a chance to, to go from the storming, norming, you know, forming, performing, right? storming, forming, norming, performing. We need to get to that performing stage and that just takes time. Um, so once you've guided those teams to the self-organization, um, let them form their team agreements and coach them through the launch. We don't want to just leave them hanging out there, but make sure that they, they get continue to get the support they need. Because you can consider this as a change initiative. And for a change initiative, we need to make sure that we're continuing to, surprise, to provide the resources after launch. And we're not just walking away from that. So continue to provide coaching. Um, the throughput increase for those teams was um, over 100% throughput. Now, throughput's not a great measure of success. I know that, right? But for new, ta new Agile teams, we need to um, you know, go with what we got. But also, once those teams did form, each team did create a product goal or each product owner had a product goal. Each product owner had outcome-based metrics that they were, they were measuring against. So that was another really important part of this is making sure that we're measuring not busyness, but how are we actually going, what kind of progress are we making towards our goal? Uh, okay, so some tips overall for this is number one, start with the customer um, and making sure that we're always keeping in mind what's the benefit we're trying to provide and who's our customer, who are we providing that benefit to? Also look from the outside in. It can be very easy for us to say, well, my product is, is Java. That's what we do. And we provide Java to the testing team, right? It's better if you can think about from the outside in. Also keep an open mind. This is scary, right? And a lot of people can find this scary, can, can find it threatening, for example. It's not threatening, right? Think about by analogy, just by analogy. When these product definitions does not need to change reporting structure, right? Back when we used to run projects, right? We didn't change who the person reported to because they were on a particular project. The same thing applies here. If they're supporting a particular product, it does not need to impact the reporting structure unless the organization decides that it should, but it's not necessarily tied. And above all, focus on what's the value that we're providing. So once those products are formed, make sure that you're identifying outcome-based metrics. If my goal is to um, process healthcare claims, I should be measuring quality. I should be measuring timely payments. I should be measuring things that my customer cares about, payment accuracy. I don't wanna just measure how busy is my team. What I wanna measure is, are they having a positive outcome, a positive impact on customer outcomes? And is that um, trending upwards or is it trending downwards, right? Any metric is a conversation starter. So that's what I had for today. I wanna to open it up to any questions at this point. That's great. Thank you, Mary, for that um, presentation. Um, whilst people are thinking about their questions, I must admit this, this self-organizing part of actually creating an organization, giving them the chance to actually self-organize. And I, I'd probably just ask this question. So imagine that 30 people went into that team and then the product owner says, um, I don't think I can actually give enough work for those 30 people. How would that actually pan out? Yeah, that actually, it was part of the conversation. Uh, when we when we went into those rooms, I kind of I kind of uh, didn't really speak to that part. But when you first, when they first went into those rooms, we did have the product owner ask, um, look at the people who were in the room and each individual in the room was asked to put their skills on a sticky note. Um, and the product owner was able to knew coming in what kind of skills they needed because we'd sp spoken with the resource managers in advance. And the product owner was able to sort of perform a skills industry inventory. Do we have the Java developers? Do we have the testers? And do we have about how much I needed for my budget? Because each product owner did have a target number of people on their team. Um, and I think, I think uh, we did not have too much promises. Some people did scoot around a little bit that, oh, we have too many people in this one. But it wasn't, it wasn't a wholesale type of thing. And I think part of that is because these teams, these folks had already been at the organization for a long time. So they were pretty familiar with the product. And I think a lot of people had pre even selected before the fans what, where they wanted to be. So there mm -hmm. wasn't too much turn for us. 
Um, but it is something I would watch out for for newer products. That being said, for newer products, you're going to probably have a smaller number of people, right? So it probably, again, the churn probably won't be too high. But every situation is different. I would make, make sure, though, that each product owner knows what's my budget that I've got. And if my budget is for, you know, 10 people and 30 have shown up, then we have to have a max, right? And that can be something that's communicated in the team. We have too many people here. Um, we're going to ask uh, ask people, right, to, to to move on to the next product. You should have plans for that before you begin this cross this this team. So what we did was if there was too many people in the room, they went back to the parent room and they asked the facilitator, send me over to breakout room XYZ. And that's how we mm. handled it. Yeah, great. I actually heard an, of an example where basically um because the the teams another different situation where the teams wanted to have make sure that we stay cross-functional so if you ended up with my friend and your friend and the other friend all the testers going into one team then you can actually um iterate on that and say hey guys um all the testers are in one team um, how are we going to be cross-functional? How are we going to self-organize around that to make sure that every team has a tester? How are we going to do that? Let's iterate again. And yeah. let them self-organize to actually say, oh, yeah, there's no testers in team one and two. Okay, so guys, we did want to be together, but um, uh, maybe we need to actually self-organize because we need to be cross-functional. Yes. So... There's alternatives, there's different situations. So this is great. Thank yes. you. Let's take some questions from the audience. Okay. We've got a couple of questions coming through. So please, audience, um, everybody's with us. Thank you very much for all these questions. Keep bringing them. Okay. And uh, we'll try and get through a lot of them because we've got a good 10 minutes. So Mary, um, I'll just go in the order. Uh, what are your thoughts on building platforms, the concept of platform teams who work in service of product teams? So we're thinking about uh, continuous de de deployment or like the systems team. Um, and so they're enabling their products as opposed to actually um, being part of the teams. What is, what's your, your think about this is a large organization context? Sure. So I'm going to, I'm going to use the word service teams instead of platform, because to me, a platform could be something a little bit different. And I'll come back to that question. But if you think about service teams, let's say that you've defined your product as the website. We're selling pink polo shirts, right? This is our website. This is our platform. We've got content writers, image people, marketing people, Java people, testers, whatever we need to build this website. Um, and how big do we draw that product box? Because technically the website runs on servers. Do I need the server people in my team? Probably not. Because mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't typically have dependencies on the server team. And to me, that is how I, that's how we decide. Because we could go on forever. We could even have the finance people on this team. But we don't need them on this team. It's where do I have dependencies? most commonly and on a day-to-day -day basis? Do I have dependencies on the server team? And probably not. So if, in my opinion, I think it is acceptable uh, to have some teams that do remain as service teams. Um, those teams are teams that support multiple products. They're not necessarily on those scrum teams, but those scrum teams may occasionally request work from them. I think of the help desk, right? I'm not gonna have the help desk staff probably on my scrum team. Maybe there's on my product team. There, I'm sure there's some a, a case where I would, but in this particular simpler example, I'm not. And they would remain as a service team. And I think that is acceptable. But if yeah. you're talking about platforms, right? Let's think about a platform for a moment, it's something slightly different. Let's imagine that, you know, you are uh, Sports Illustrated, right? The swimsuit issue is a different product from the other issues, right? But we still have the Sports Illustrated platform, right? That's a different, that's not what I'm talking about here. Does that make sense? Um, well, David, if you want to add anything in the chat, actually, with regards to that, if that hasn't answered your question, thank you, David. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add to that, and that makes me think, actually. Uh, Mary, imagine that you actually have a team and you've got everything working really well cross-functionally, but then an impediment comes up, and that impediment creates that dependency with a system team or a service team that you currently have. Um, with a retrospective, obviously, what would make sense is there's no harm in somebody else 
that's actually not needed most of the time to actually join the team for actually working through that impediment, whether it be at the beginning of a sprint, in the middle of a sprint, or for a couple of sprints. What would you say to that? I would ask the team how they want to handle that. Um, it is okay to have people that are supporting the team join, for example, sprint planning to figure out how we're going to handle this, this impediment that we have. Um, mm. It is okay for the scrum team to work closely with maybe a service team. Do they need to be added to the team? Maybe not. I would ask the team. It would really depend on how long is this impediment going to be with us, right? Yeah. Um, how I, I hesitate to use the word impediment, but how long is this issue going to be with us? Is it multiple sprints? So really, I would just ask the team, how do you want to handle this? Do we want to have one person working with this service team member to resolve this issue? Do we want to have this service team member join our refinement meetings? Do we want to have them join our sprint planning meetings? How do we want to handle this? Brilliant. No right way to do it. No wrong way. Absolutely. Take it to the team. I love that. Um, another question from our audience. What are the metrics to consider to evaluate outcomes? Um, yeah. That's a great question. It is a great question. We actually have a whole class on that with Scrum.org. It's called Evidence-Based mm. Management, um, where we talk about the different categories of metrics. And the way I use evidence-based management is actually as um, a way to help me brainstorm other kinds of metrics. Because to me, when I'm, when I'm asking myself, what, what metrics do I use? There's a moment of deer in the headlights. And so I need to think about outside the box. Um, and these metrics um, can really help us understand, um, you know, am I, am I being thoughtful? What am I trying to accomplish with this product? And making sure that I'm identifying metrics that actually measure progress towards that. So if I'm trying to include, increase um, my, my current value, right, my current sales, and I need to identify metrics around that. If I'm trying to uh, improve our time to market, then I need to identify metrics around that. So it really helps you think more strategically about metrics. So those are covered in two different classes in the Professional Agile Leadership class, which is one of my favorites. And also that's a two-day class where it can be four half days for leaders, directors, managers, scrum masters. Um, so that's a great class. Or you can just do the, the standalone evidence-based management class, which is a one-day uh, typically class. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, which actually extends on the product ownership of actually strategy of product. I love that class, professional agile leadership, evidence-based management. Yeah, really, really, really impactful, uh, great training uh, for product owners and also for scrum masters to actually understanding strategy. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Um, oh, it scrolled off. Uh, Jan, I hope that answers your question, Jan. Let us know in the chat. Um, let's move on. We've got uh, another five, six minutes. Um, is that okay for you, Mary? A Absolutely. couple more questions? Yeah. Okay. So why do some organizations start developing a product and stop abruptly midway due to lack of funding? Mm, okay. Mm. So in my opinion, the, the times I've seen that happen is what well, the, the times I've seen that happen is when They've defined, it does come back to product development, actually. Um, they've defined their products really narrowly. And yeah. they don't have a, a holistic view of what do we need to accomplish this? So let's imagine for a moment, I'm building some kind of system, right? Um, claims processing system, right? When I go about defining that product, I want to make sure that I'm looking at it holistically. Um, I want to be able to sure, make sure that um, I'm looking end to end at that product. A lot of times what, what happens is people define their products really narrowly and this part of the system is doing really great. And this part of the system is kind of behind. We're 50% done. That's not correct, right? It needs to be end to end. And people get into this and they're, they don't have clear metrics of how it's going. Um, they, they have not considered the integration effort that's going to be, it's going to be needed to bring those things together. So my, my advice to you is anytime you're developing something, let's think of a pizza website, right? You need to think of it holistically, not just um, little pieces of the ordering process and, and the invoicing process. We need to be able to take an order, deliver it, and, and, and build them all the way through. We can't just take orders. We can't just do part of it. It needs to be end-to-end. -end. And so in my experience, when companies get into a product and they haven't really thought about you know, as a whole what it's taking to deliver this thing, 
that's when I see people giving up because they, they didn't realize that the integration effort is going to be a nightmare. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, love that. I hope that's answered your question, um, Idris. Um, I noticed that Vishal actually gave you another couple of comments and David as well. Um, we're out of questions and we've got five minutes left. Um, maybe uh, somebody wants to actually uh, put their hand up and just ask a question like that. Anybody, put your hand up. We've got time for one more question and come on, come on stage. Yeah. Karen. I'm on stage. Yeah. Okay, so uh, very impressive the commitment of time that you were able to uh, have with your teams. So my question is, how did you acquire that time commitment for the work you did with the workshops and sessions? Who approved it? And what industry were you working in? Um, so it, it, as far as as the you know, who approved it, it really depended, right? So generally speaking though, we're going in and talking to, you know, at different levels of the organization have done this. So when you're doing talking and defining products for a whole division, of course you gotta get buy-in from the executive team. But if you're talking about just taking a moment and defining, making sure we understand the products for the smaller part of the organization, maybe it could be just a director or a manager. So it, it depends. Um, and most of these, the product definitions that I've been a part of have been in the healthcare industry. Although uh, branching out into the different uh, shared services as well. Right. So are we saying state government or federal or Private. actual? Huh? Private. Private. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes one can run into a lack of understanding. I, actually, this was not an agile project in any sense of the word. So probably that was the root cause of all the problems. You know, so, okay, so thanks so much. You know, might consider if you're if you're having trouble getting buy-in. Um, one thing I would suggest suggest is start small. Right, try it with a small initiative, even just a temporary project to get some experience. Make sure it's going to work for you. Don't try and do the whole organization and define products at the get-go. Try using Scrum or Agile in a smaller scale and prove that it can work before you try and roll it out to the whole organization. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. Mary, well, thank you so much for actually joining us here on Scrum Masters of the Universe. And thank you everybody for joining us. I think we hit 62 people online so excellent that was really brilliant and thank you for sharing all that and uh, i hope we soaked up so much i did anyway thank you thank you so much for inviting me i, I greatly appreciate it and i hope to see you all at scrum day october 23rd 2024 in madison wisconsin save the day everybody thank and you not to forget we have one last meetup for the year that's on thursday and we have ravi talking about retrospective so see you all there then thank you mary really appreciate you being here thank you so much for having me yep thank you very much everybody goodbye if we don't see you again have a great festive season and uh and rest well and come back in full strength for the new year otherwise um this week later on we have ravi vermi who will be with us. And uh, this is going to be amazing. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Scrum Masters of the Universe. And thank you, the audience. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.